Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of September 9th, 2024. The weekly top three is a regular segment on the Michael Dukes Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.10 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the Weekly Top 3 also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you can also follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, We explain our frustration with the governor's veto of the proposed rental car tax in the face of the state's ongoing $1.5 billion annual budget deficit. Second, we discuss some research that, contrary to what some think, concludes it's actually upper income Alaska families who splurge most at PFD time. And third, we discuss the role that fiscal policy can and should play in responding to Alaska's working age migration issue. And now let's join Michael. Let's get right to it, Brad, because we got a we got a lot to cover this morning and I want to talk about it. And your first uh, uh, topic for the weekly top three today is uh, does the governor understand that he's facing a 1.5 billion? We have gone to the governor's 10 year plan enough times and pointed it out to people that his plan is the one that's outlined the fact that we have billion dollar deficits moving forward. So this seems like a weird question. Does he understand that we have a big deficit coming or not? What what are what are you what are you what are you reaching at here? Well, Michael, I, I as a as a predicate to the to the subject, I just want to point out that that every Friday we do an update of the state's 10-year outlook uh, based upon the most recent uh, projections from the Permanent Fund Board of or the Permanent Fund Corporation of the uh, PFE, PFD, PF, per- Permanent Fund Earnings over the uh, Permanent Fund Returns over the subsequent uh, projection period, as well as an update based upon uh, current uh, oil prices. And the most recent one that, that we did last Friday shows that over the 10-year period between 25, FY25 and FY33, we're running a $1.8 billion, billion dollar annual deficit, current law deficit, uh, based on current law, based upon the current PFD statutes and and other statutes, a $1.8 billion per year uh, deficit. That is that on average over the period of time, that means that nearly 30% of the budget is being, of spending is being deficit financed nearly 30% of spending is being deficit financed. That's worse than the federal government. The federal government is around 25%, around 25% of federal spending is being deficit financed. In Alaska, around 30% of the budget is being deficit financed. And as a percent of Alaska adjusted gross income, we're running a deficit that's equal to about 5% of Alaska adjusted gross income. That's, that's, That's how much that's a lot. We, yeah. we, we and, end to clarify, up, and to clarify, when you say running a deficit, essentially what you're saying is if they use the current statute as written in law, this is how much we'd be upside down. But instead, they're taking that one point eight billion dollars from the PFD, from the people. And it, so we're spending the money, but we're just not following the law and we're we're upside down. Right. And the five percent, the five percent of adjusted gross income tells you that we're taking five percent out of what should be in the private sector 
adjusted gross income, 5% of the adjusted gross income that should be in the private sector. We're taking it out of the private sector and we're moving it over to the government sector to uh, just to finance that deficit. It doesn't tell you how much of adjusted gross income federal or state spending is. It tells you just to cover the deficit in state spending, we're moving 5% uh, out of the uh, out of a out of the private sector over to the uh, over to the government sector. Uh, that's that's and that's a huge amount. Uh, that's more for, again. That's more than occurs at the federal level on average out of a, out of adjusted federal adjusted gross income that's being moved over to the uh, that's being moved over to to finance the government deficit. There. All right. So against that background, we have an action by this governor the governor this last this past week that just floors me. Uh, it's similar to one that happened a couple of years ago that you and I discussed on a, on a segment then, but it just, I, I just, I, I don't understand what he's doing. And this one I think is even worse. The governor vetoed, uh, uh, what the headline says is a tax break, but actually was a tax that, that, that provided for collection of tax, uh, for renting vehicles through the Turo app, um, Right, you rent you can rent vehicles through uh, through an app, <laughs> private vehicles through a, through an app online, and right. while and while the state statutes currently provide that that's subject to tax, the Dunleavy Revenue Administration, Adam Crum's administration, has made the decision not to assess that tax, not to not to go after that tax on owners, um, and so there was there was a uh, a bill in the legislature that was worked on, compromised, reached a compromise that would effectively shift the burden of the tax or shift the collection of the tax from the owners of the vehicles who are renting through the Turo app to Turo, to the platform, and collect the tax uh, from the platform. And Turo agreed to that, and all of the parties uh, involved uh, agreed to that, to change the structure of the tax in order to tax Turo at a lower rate than the current nominal tax that's not, but that's not being collected, to change the the tax at a lower rate and collect it through the through the from Turo from the from the platform as opposed to not collecting it from the owners as we're as we're currently doing, and that would have resulted in some increase uh, in revenues to the state uh, to be able to finally set up a a, a system where <clears throat> the administration's Department of Revenue would actually go in and collect the tax as opposed to the situation where we face now where they've decided not to collect the tax that would increase revenues to the state and the governor vetoed it <laughs> now now keep in mind this is not a new tax this is simply the tax exists it exists at a higher rate than 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 the legislation that was passed it's not a new tax it is in fact a, a nominal tax decrease but it it is a tax in the sense that we would be able to collect the tax uh, and be able to uh, to receive those revenues to reduce the deficit a little bit, at least. Um, the governor vetoed it, and he said in a message accompanying the veto announcement, the governor said that unnecessary taxation of a new and growing industry is bad public policy. Accordingly, I have vetoed this bill. Unnecessary taxation? We have a $1.8 billion average debt over the uh, deficit over the next eight years. Unnecessary taxation. <laughs> We're going to have taxation. We're going to close that deficit through taxation of middle and lower income Alaska families through PFD cuts. And, uh, and, and now we have a way potentially of closing a little bit of that through, through enforcing a tax that's been on the books that hasn't been a force enforced a way of, 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 of capturing a little bit of that taxation through somebody else. And the governor calls it unnecessary taxation. I, it, just, it, it stuns me. Here's what I have to say to that. Turnabout's fair play. You're going to ignore the, sta the statute for the dividend and everything else? Okay. I mean, you know, I this is a tax, as you said, that was already on the books. But the Department of Revenue apparently has not been going after really anybody. They've occasionally tapped a bank account or something for something like that. This is a tax that's already in place, but they haven't shown an interest in really going after anybody on it. The car rental companies are the ones that are really up in arms about it. 
Uh, so in on the one hand, taxation is theft. And I'm like, OK, that's kind of cool. Uh, but I, I mean, I see your point. I see your point. Don't get me wrong. But I also feel like there's a little bit of turnabout's fair play. You're going to ignore the statute on the dividend and not pay that. OK, well, we'll just ignore this tax statute. And uh, since the governor said he doesn't have an interest in pursuing it against the individuals who own the cars, then. OK, I mean, I see I, I definitely see your point, but at the same time, I'm like, OK, you're not going to follow the law. We won't follow the law. This is a slippery slope. But at the same time, I have a smile, Brad. I just I can't help but not say taxation is theft. And you guys and, and again, this is a big push from big companies that are out there trying to, you know, use the government to say, you guys have got to level the playing field for us uh, because these ride sharing apps or the, the rental apps are changing it up. It's the same thing that's happening with Airbnb and the bed tax and everything else. It's the disruptors of this new technology is throwing stuff into a tailspin. So while I agree with your point, I also am smiling because I like to see it personally, but that's just me. But Michael, you're seeing it personally in terms of PFD cuts. You're seeing it personally oh, yeah. in terms of a lower PFD than otherwise would be the case if we if we broaden the tax base. This, this you know, we we went through. You and I went through this uh, as you're vaping. You and I went through this a couple of years ago when the governor vetoed a tax that got that had gotten through the legislature uh, to uh, increase uh, the tax on e-cigarettes or 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 uh, have a tax on e-cigarettes. Um, and he vetoed that and, uh, uh, saying again at the, at the same time, let's see in vetoing the bill, that bill, the governor wrote, there are, there were many conversations about what an appropriate level of tax would be, but ultimately a tax increase on the people of Alaska is not something I can support. Again, we already had a deficit. It wasn't 1.8 billion. But we already had a deficit. You can see the deficit coming at that point. Um, a, a tax on the people of Alaska is not something I can support. He is taxing Alaska by not finding broad-based substitutes. We are having additional PFD cuts. That is a tax that falls hardest on middle and lower income Alaska families. It falls hardest. It only falls on Alaska families. And it falls hardest on middle and lower income Alaska families. We do have a tax and the governor's veto of these measures to develop alternative revenue sources uh, is just, I mean, he's just, he's continuing for him to say it's not a tax, for him to say it's an unnecessary tax uh, on, on, on these companies or on this particular activity in the case of the e-cigarettes, for him to say we shouldn't be taxing is simply another way of saying we should be taxing. Alaska families through PFD cuts because it's one or the other. Well, that is true. I mean, that part is definitely true. And again, uh, you know, w this whole thing is assuming that if we did receive more tax revenues, um, that somehow that would offset the uh, the taking of the PFD. But without a without a spending cap, none of that's ever going to happen, right? We could we could tax everybody and everything. We could tax the freight on air coming into Alaska, and it wouldn't matter because they would spend every dollar of it because they have no spending cap uh, and no no downward pressure there either. So, I mean, this is, it, you're, you're pointing out a great, it's a great point. Uh, but at the same time, until we get our fiscal ducks in a row and get a spending cap in there, we could tax everything we want. And well, survey says they will spend every dollar of it and then some. I disagree with that uh, in, in one respect. If we had a broad-based tax that affected the top 20%, the top 20% affected the top 20% and oil companies, if oil companies were subject to, uh, in addition, were subject to uh, an adjustment in their tax levels to reflect the deficits that we, that we have going on, you would begin to see pushback on spending uh, from those segments. And we don't see that now. Now, yeah. is that true of, of, of Turo? And is it true of the e-cigarette uh, uh, industry? I don't know, but 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 certainly a broad-based tax would have that pushback, even yeah. even in the absence of a spending cap. I definitely see your point here, Brad, and it is frustrating to uh, to to you know see uh, there should be some equitability in some of this and everything else, but at the same time, I get so tickled whenever a tax gets <laughs> ignored. It's I can't help myself, man. I can't help myself. Well, All right, Michael, just just keep in mind when the tax is ignored, you're paying you and your family. 
And oh yeah. And everybody oh. else's family on here are paying the consequences of it through increased PFD cuts. We're already paying. I mean, it, you know, like I'm already expecting the PFD to go away at this point. I mean, I just think it's inevitable. Uh, and so if I can claw back anything, I might just want to buy another car just to put it on Toro just for that reason alone. I was reading this and I was just laughing as I was reading the various articles because I'm just like, uh, I was actually, I wasn't laughing. I was cackling with glee because I'm watching these things, these people not wanting to turn it, people just refusing to submit their, their tax to the government. And then the good news is the bad news is, is that if somebody else gets to be governor, they could decide to direct the department of revenue to go after all those people. I mean, right now it's kind of a non-issue, but, uh, in the future it could happen. So, but it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's crazy, Brad. And, uh, the, the danger here, as I said, when I said earlier, it's a slippery slope is of course, the idea of the Irish democracy, which Brian mentions here is that, you know, they ignore the, st the, the statute. And then, so then we ignore the statute. And so then they ignore this. And pretty soon you've got, you know, the rule of law means almost nothing at some point. And you're like, okay, that's, that's, that's horrific. But like I said, without a without some kind of spending cap, they could tax almost everything that they wanted. Uh, Brian also makes the point. I thought the tax revenue on marijuana was supposed supposed to close the fiscal gap. Well, maybe on the spending levels that they had back when that was instituted, you may have been right. But today, they just want to you know any uh, oh there's another dime. Let me just hoover up every dollar that's in the vicinity and spend it. I mean that's just kind of where we're at, right? Yeah, the problem, the problem with that thinking, Michael, and, 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 and you know this, you know this is going to be my response. You're, you're, you're playing the provocative radio host <laughs> well here. But, but the problem with that is every time we just ignore it or every time Department of Revenue, I mean, this is the government ignoring going after the tax, right? This is the Department of Revenue saying, nah, we're not, we're not going to chase that down. Um, yes, it is in the first instance, the, 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 the taxpayer that's ignoring it, but then the governor's follow or the, the government's following up, the governor's following up by, by ignoring collecting the tax. Every time we go down this road, it just means additional PFD cuts. And, and it just means more and more and more reliance on the PFD. Here's the message that the governor sends to the legislature. Um, uh, each time he does this, he did, he sent it with the, with the vaping uh, veto. He sends it with this veto is you guys go through a bunch of effort, legislature, you guys go through a bunch of effort, you reach a bunch of compromises, you have a bunch of hearings, you do a bunch of work, you bring a bunch of people in and knock their heads together. Uh, you, uh, uh, you know, you fight through uh, opposition, you, you get people to agree to things they don't otherwise agree to, you get Turo to agree to do something that, that it otherwise doesn't want to. You go through all that effort and guess what? <laughs> it was all for nothing because I'm going to veto any tax you pass I'm going to veto it at the end. I mean, basic, it, to some degree, this is this is part of Dunleavy's federal campaign, right? It's part of his campaign to be part of the Trump administration. It's part of his campaign. Right. If, he, right. if, he does, if he doesn't succeed in that, it's part of his campaign to, to be a congressperson or, or a senator um, at some point, to run for federal office at some point, um, because he wants to be known as the no tax, no tax governor. It's it's not it's really not that different from the old Vic Coring uh, 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 position uh, before Vic was you know became involved in Vico and all that stuff. Went Vic to the was, house of many doors. Yes, yes. Vic was known as Vic was known as no taxes. He wouldn't vote for a tax no matter what. Uh, wouldn't vote for increased all taxes. Wouldn't vote for any sort of tax, notwithstanding the fact the legislature kept spending. Uh, Vic wouldn't vote for any sort of tax. It was just no tax. And this governor is, is essentially adopting that playbook, which would be fine <laughs> if we weren't running $1.8 billion deficits, if we weren't running deficits that are, that are 5% of Alaska adjusted gross income deficits, not, not total spending deficits that are 5% of Alaska adjusted gross income. Um, it'd be fine if, 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 you know, if, if we weren't running those for the governor to be a no tax governor, but yeah. that's not what's happening. Rick says, Alaska has one huge problem. It's called government. <laughs> and I would not disagree at this point. Uh, Donna also makes the point that I was trying to make earlier. 
Taxes have generally been considered voluntary. The bill should have eliminated the tax altogether, but the round car company <laughs> lobbyists would have killed it, just like the taxi companies going after Uber and the hotels going after Airbnb. And, the, you know, they, they want the government to level the playing field uh, on these innovators. Uh, we we got we to gotta jump back into it. I know you want to comment on it. Hold your thought on that till the next break. We're continuing now. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, is our guest. We're ready to... Uh, move on into number two of the weekly top three where brad asked the question who wastes the pfd more uh i mean i have an answer for that that's called government that's um i win there you go that's the applause you know cue the applause that was it the government wastes the pfd uh brad what uh, what what are your thoughts here on this there's some there's some research out michael that i hadn't caught up with it's been out for a couple of years but it was one of those things where I read something that led to another, that led to another, that led to another, that I finally uh, caught up uh, with. There's some research out uh, that looks at an issue that that we talk a lot about in Alaska, uh, but I didn't know had had research on it. Uh, the issue is when you get the PFD, when the PFD is distributed, uh, there's all this, all, there, there's all these claims that oh, you know. Middle and lower income Alaska people, particularly lower income Alaska people, waste the PFD by splurging it and spending it on, on, uh, on toys and on things that uh, that they shouldn't, and uh, and and that's a reason. Some claim that's a reason for cutting the PFD because it's otherwise just wasted. It's being it's being spent splurged uh, on things that aren't necessities of life. There's some re- research that 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 uses a data source that uh, hasn't been available for long, but looks into a data source that analyzes spending by income bracket. Um, uh, it can an- you can analyze spending by income bracket uh, in the state and, and other states um, after, after any given event. And there's an author uh, who, and this is published in the Quarterly Journal of, Ac- of Economics in 2018, there's an author who looked into uh, what income brackets had a surge in spending uh, after, uh, after the distribution of the PFD. And it's a fascinating finding. The finding is that um, while uh, there is a small surge, uh, uh, what, what he calls the marginal consumption, there's a small surge uh, in spending in the middle and lower income brackets, the big surge in spending that results in the overall average spending showing a big surge um, in the fourth quarter uh, following the distribution of the PFD, the big surge is in the upper income brackets. And when you look at, when you compare the two, while there is a small surge uh, in the middle and lower income brackets, uh, what really happens uh, is that that bump in in income is smoothed out over time. There's a small surge uh, in uh, in the fourth quarter, and then it sort of smooths out and stays fairly constant until the next PFD shows up. In the upper income brackets, what this research shows is that there's a huge bump in the fourth quarter. And then, and then it comes back down and smooths out at a at a lower level than it would have been had the had the the PFD income been uh, been smoothed out. So what it's really showing is is all of that surplus spending, or a lot of that surplus spending that we see in the fourth quarter that people have historically attributed to low income, middle and low income families going out and buying toys or or, or doing some sort of splurging. That 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 average bump in income is really coming from the from the upper income brackets. This adds to this this research adds to other research that's out there that I'm that I'm catching up with as I as I now start into delving into into what the academics have said. Uh, uh, catches up with some other research that shows that there is additional that that as a result of the PFD or distribution of of, of money through the PFD, there's an increase uh, in health spending um, uh, in, uh, in among middle and lower income uh, brackets, and there's an increase in health 
uh, uh, outcomes as a result of increased spending um, in the middle and lower income bracket. So basically what we're beginning to see is research that shows that that all that the, some of these preconceptions that we that we've built around the PFD over time, based upon these occasional stories of you know somebody walked into the marijuana shop or somebody walked in and bought a bought a, a, a snow machine uh, as a result of you know having the PFD, that that those stories are you know, are are misleading in the sense that they're leaving the impression that it's middle and lower income Alaska families that are splurging with this money. Yeah, no, I mean, my estimation has always been that the lower and middle income people are generally, uh, well, I mean, for myself, I can tell you that up until the time, maybe 10 years ago, and this is right before they vetoed a big chunk of the PFD, the majority of those PFDs were not spent splurging. I was putting tires on the car. I was putting fuel in the heating oil tank. I was buying clothes for the kids. I was using it for the, some of those last minute uh, towards winter or some of the big items that I'd been putting off up until that point. And it was only after I moved down here within a year or two, I was able to to actually put some of that in savings and bank some of it. I wasn't using it for hookers and blow or, or for trips to Hawaii or big screen TVs. Um, but, you know, that seems to be the disdain that a lot of the legisl a lot of folks in the legislature seem to think that you know we get the money those of us who are in the middle lower income brackets they get they get the money and they just go loo, 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 and they go out and they go crazy with it not realizing that it's a it's a corner it's a pivotal cornerstone for the economy yeah that's yeah. that's one of the that's one of the points that the research makes it makes that that middle and lower income Alaska families are value the PFD treat it as part of income um, there's some evidence that there's increased sa uh, 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 savings uh, going on uh, uh, in that category uh, when the PFD comes in. I mean, that's that's part of the explanation for why you don't have the same spike peak in spending you have in the upper, upper income brackets. That 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 they value the PFD, they use it to meet uh, expenses. Some evidence that it goes uh, that the kids portion is going into savings accounts. Uh, for the kids, that's part of the reason, again, you don't have the spike, even if the parents uh, are spending it, the kids portion is going into the is going into the savings accounts for the kids. Um, and and so you're yeah, I mean, there's there's evidence that it's being put that the PFD is being put to good use uh, as income by by those by those income brackets where you have the issue where you if there is an issue. But where you have the issue with the with the spike spending uh, in the PFD is in the is in the upper income brackets, and you know the evidence is that that it's not a very significant portion of of their income in the upper income brackets, uh, treated more as discretionary income, um, and and so some of this, I mean, begin, I'm beginning to see some of these stories that we've heard over time about oh the lower income brackets waste it they spend it on toys or or they spend it on uh, uh, on things that uh, that that aren't really you know important necessities of life they just they blow it uh, uh, somehow some of this is projection <laughs> by those in the upper income brackets who are doing exactly that uh, with the with the income and they're saying well if we're doing it that way if we're treating it that way if we're treating it as as discretionary uh, 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 joy income, uh, then everybody else must be, and 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 those in the middle income middle and lower income brackets uh, certainly certainly must be. Uh, but that's not what the that's not what the research is showing. Right. So, it, it, so I'm sorry. Go ahead. And finish. No, no. It's just showing that the middle middle and lower income brackets are in fact more responsible with the yeah. with the money than those in the upper. Some of the most ridiculous comments we've seen have come out of the legislature over the last twenty years regarding people who are in the middle to lower income bracket, they're drinking it all up. They're spending it on trips to Hawaii. They're buying big screen TVs. They're doing whatever. But again, I agree with you. I think it's more projection because I never met anybody who was, you know, <clears throat> making $50,000 a year with a family who was like, oh, let's go to Hawaii on these dividends, right? They were always like, let's put new tires on the car. Let's, uh, you know, let's fill up the heating, the, you know, the, the fuel tank's going to be 5,000 bucks. Let's put it all in there so we have heat this winter. Uh, so, so who is wasting the PFD, right? I mean, who is wasting the, who cares 
what they spend it on, get it into the economy, says Kevin in the chat room. And I agree. That money should be in the economy, in the private economy, not in the public economy. So who does waste the more, what, you know, what, I, I think I know your answer here, Brad, but who wastes more? Well, to the extent there is waste, and, and your answer, government's probably the, the winner because yes, government yes. is taxing it and then spending it. But but to the extent there is waste, and you define waste as discretionary spending on non-necessities, immediate discretionary spending on non-necessities, if that's how you define waste, which is you know a, 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 the theme behind a lot of these stories, that is discretionary on non discretionary spending on non necessities. If you define it that way, then what the research is showing is that it's those in the upper income brackets that are that are that are doing that, because it's they're the, they're the ones that have the immediate bump uh, in spending in the fourth quarter. Uh, the the those in the middle and lower income brackets are holding on to it. There is some bump. Uh, going on, but a moderate bump compared to what's going on in the upper income brackets. Um, and and they're holding on to it and spreading it the benefit of it throughout uh, throughout the year. Or in the case of those who uh, who take the, the kids money and the kids, yeah, I mean, children is a large share of the uh, of the PFD, a, a large share of the PFD goes to children. Those who deposited in accounts for their kids, either college accounts or savings accounts, for when they reach uh, uh, an age, um, that is that is going on more in the middle and lower income brackets than it's going on in the upper income brackets. And I think I think that's an important point. I mean, I you you always get this pushback of oh they just waste it. You know, you, you, they waste the PFD. They the middle and lower which income is why we should waste. spend it for them because they waste it even right. though we're the ones that are, you know, again, buying trips to Hawaii. But, I mean, they're wasting it, so we should be in control of it because we know better than they how to spend it. Exactly right. Exactly right. And that's where the, that's where the research on, on spending on health care comes in. There is, there is increased spending on health care following the distribution uh, of the PFD. So we have people who are taking care of, who are using the money to, ta to help take care of themselves instead of the government taking care of themselves. And so those who argue we ought to cut the PFD because those people don't know how to take care of themselves, but we know how to spend it and we know how to take care of them. The research is showing that's not true, that they do yeah. know how to, that, 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 that the recipients are taking, using that money to take care of themselves. It's, uh, it's, it, you know, uh, again, it, it is the polit it, this is, this is one of the ultimate symptoms of the politician disease. First of all, they project their own behavior on other people. And then they tell other people that they know better than them, how they should spend that money. Uh, and then, uh, and, and just, you know, we should shut up and sit down and, and do what we're told, uh, essentially, uh, because they, they have the wisdom to spend it when we don't, obviously. We're in the break right now. Uh, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for sustainable budgets. Brad. <laughs> Uh, let's go back to Donna's comment because I know you wanted to comment and I cut you off there at the end. Use taxes have generally been considered voluntary. The bill should have been should have eliminated the tax altogether, but rental car company lobbyists would have killed it. Just like taxi companies going after Uber, hotels going after bed, you know, Airbnb, et cetera. Your thought on that before we move on to the other stuff because I know you wanted to respond to that. One point eight billion dollars in deficit. One point eight billion dollars in deficit. Yeah, five percent of adjusted gross income. The deficits, the deficits, roughly thirty percent of spending. I mean, okay, great. Yeah, yeah. Let's eliminate all taxes. Let's eliminate PFD cuts, and then we would eliminate all taxes. But well, that's not that's not the state we live in. Look, it, it, it's it's one of the. I mean, outside of getting a spending cap, the only other way is to. Uh, the only other way is to starve the beast, right? You either have to starve it of revenues or you have to give it a spending cap. I no, mean, we're not starving. Sure. We're not starving it of, of, of revenues, Michael. They just keep going with deeper and deeper and deeper PFD cuts. Yeah, maybe right. one day we run out of the PFD and then we can then we can starve the beast. Well, that's great. What have we done then? I mean, we we've just. I, I agree. Up. I agree. I mean, that would be. I mean, at this point, Brad, like I said, I've kind of just thrown my hands up in the air and think of the PFD's gone, right? I mean, it, it's it, it's going to limp along for however long it's going to be. But these people have no no fiscal control. They have no, uh, you know, uh, uh, they just have no urge to even slow down. 
Oh, there's another dollar. Oh, there's another dollar. Oh, there's another dollar. They don't care. They're going to consume every available dollar and hoover it up and spend it out because they know better than us how we should spend it. I, I mean, I agree that with your point, again, I'll go back to saying I agree with your point, but at the same time, I, I mean, how do, how do people, how do people continue to live? Well, maybe they avoid the taxes. That's how they do it to continue to keep things rolling, to keep the lights on while they're waiting for the government to figure it out, uh, which they obviously are not going to do because there's no discipline and there's no will to get it done at this point. Uh, then we're all doomed. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, I'm, I, Alaska, I'm only... Alaska, Alaska is unique. Alaska has a high cost of living. Alaska has a, a lot of issues, uh, uh, and and the PFD does a lot to solve some of those issues. It does some to solve the high cost of living. If we're just going to say, oh, it's just gone, uh, there's no reason to try to defend it. There's no reason to try to put the brakes on. There's no reason to try to get alternative sources of revenue, uh, including some that would help put the brakes on. There's no reason to do that. We'll just keep on going down this road. And, and everybody sort of grabs for himself uh, by ignoring taxes that they can along the way, right. then we're just all well, Again, the Irish democracy, there's the danger uh, for sure on that. Um, but, you know, I, I, I look, Brad, I, you and I agree on this, that there should be a spending cap and there should be some fiscal discipline. <laughs> Unfortunately, they just all hate us. I mean, they just they cannot they cannot see again. And you've made that you've painted the perfect picture with the first segment and now the second segment of them saying, um, well, you are the problem because you spend it on hookers and blow or whatever it is that we're spending it on. Uh, but we know better than you. That's why we need to retain the money because we have to take care of you. This is again, just a bigger move to make us and push us towards a dependency state. They don't want us to have a PFD because that gives us some measure of independence. They want to control everything. That's really what it comes down to. They want to control everything and cradle to grave you and take care of it. That, that's, that's the bottom line. That's the mind with in, in Zach Field's case, with increased government employees, increased exactly. Union well, that'll solve it. We need more government employees. Somebody said that earlier. That's all we need is more government employees. That will solve the problem. Yeah, Rick said it. We just need more government employees. That will solve all the problems, right? I mean, if hey, if you really wanted to pull yourself out of poverty, you'd get a government job. We'll create one for you. I, you obviously don't know how economics work. I'm just saying, somebody's got to pay for that, you know. But, um, yeah, it, this, uh, I did not read this full piece that you put out here from annual reviews, which goes over the whole Southern wealth, sovereign wealth fund. And I started looking at all the links and I'm like, oh my God, there's gotta be, this is, this is a deep dive. This is a rabbit hole of the internet. That's gotta be a four hour read right there. On that piece. <laughs> well, it's more than a four hour read. I've spent more than four hours going down, going down all those links. And there's some really good research out there. I mean, there's some, like the research on. Uh, on who, in fact, is who has the who's who's spending it all when they when they get it in their hands. There's really some good research out, out there. Yeah, I've actually never heard that research mentioned in the legislature or, frankly, in any of the fiscal policy discussions. So right. We need to start bringing it into the debate because I think it really helps support the point that we're trying to make, which is the PFD is a good thing, right, uh, for Alaskans. So if you want to, if you guys want to take the deep dive, I've posted it once, but I'll post it again here. This is the uh, review that's talking about sovereign wealth funds that has all the research attached to it that Brad was talking about. Because, oof, man, there is some, there's some big stuff in there, big stuff. Welcome back to the program, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, is our guest. The weekly top three continues. Uh, we're down to number three. Uh, and here we're talking about out mig or migration, in and out migration. What is the role that Alaska's fiscal uh, fiscal policy plays in the, you know, in in and out flow? We we always hear that, right? Alaska has one of the highest what they call rotation rates in the country, meaning number of people move in versus number of people move out. It's upwards of ten percent in the state of Alaska every year. Ten percent of the people move out. Ten percent new people move in. But we've been on a decline. For the longest period in Alaska history, uh, and what role uh, does the fiscal policy play in that? Brad, your thoughts? We've been on a decline of people moving into the state. We've been on a, a decline in, in, in migration uh, for the longest period in Alaska history. There's really two things in, in migration. One is out-migration, people leaving the state. And the second is in-migration, people coming into the state. 
out migration, according to according to some research, according to the the research presented at a conference last week, out migration is is running below average. That is, less people are leaving the state um, uh, currently than than have over the have over the, at least the recent past. In migration is the one that is running uh, below uh, the historical standard. Is, is has has in fact decreased over the last uh, over the la every year over the last decade. Um, and is now at a at a at a low historically low level, um, and so there was a conference, and and the and the issue was uh, how do we deal with this? What is the problem? How do we deal with it? Uh, and uh, and and was there was a lot of discussion around it. One of the things that I find interesting is there wasn't a lot of discussion about the role that fiscal policy plays uh, in this. Uh, there, there's a lot of people when they when they talk about this issue. There's a lot of people who talk about additional ways we ought to be spending money uh, to to solve the problem. We ought to be uh, making K through 12 better. We ought to be making the universities better. We ought to be making we ought to be creating more jobs. We ought to be doing this. We ought to be doing that and and creating incentives and and doing spending additional spending on childcare uh, and and making the quality of life. Uh, in Alaska, in Alaska, better. There was, there was, there was very little discussion. If and I frankly couldn't find any, but I assume there was some of putting more money in people's pockets, um, uh, which is what the which is what the PFD does, and reducing government spending would do. Putting more money in people's pockets. Uh, Alaska has a reputation in the lower forty-eight. Uh, of being a high cost state, having a high cost of living. And so when people look at opportunities in Alaska, looking at moving, moving to Alaska, they look at a situation where they believe there's a high cost of living. Question is, can we, can we, and, and so a lot of money, so their, the, their perspective is a lot of money is going to come out of their pocket dealing with the, the high cost of living higher than, than wherever they are uh, at, uh, at that point in time. Question is whether there are things we can do to, to offset that image and offset offset that effect, and we've talked about on the show in a, in a recent segment that that PFD cuts have had that PFDs have the effect of reducing the high cost of living in Alaska, not all the way down to the average, but significantly we make significant progress toward uh, toward the average cost of living throughout the U.S. with with PFDs. PFD cuts have moved Alaska back toward the high cost of living because we don't have that. We're not using that revenue to, uh, to offset uh, the high cost of high cost of living that we have here. And so, and so by, you know, by focusing on how do we spend more in certain areas or how do we make Alaska more attractive in these quality of life areas, all we're doing is exacerbating because we use the PFD cuts uh, on the, uh, to, to fund them, all we're doing is exacerbating the high cost of living problem. All we're doing is we're telling people it's going to be more expensive to live here because we're taking money out of your pockets to fund these additional things. Government, sort of the government knows best, fund these additional things that we think you're, you're going to want to, uh, to, move, to move up here. And when you focus in particular on working family, when you, working age, working families, which is, which is, where we have a deficiency, which, which is where the in-migration isn't keeping up with the out-migration. When you focus on working age, working families, you're really talking about middle-income families. And that's and, and, and the fiscal policy that we have right now to have high government spend and, you, and fund it by taking money out of the pockets, taking more money out of the pockets of middle-income fa families than we would under other alternatives, that's really pushing people away because we're telling them that the high that we're not going to offset the high cost of living, that the that living costs, the money out of your pocket is going to be high. Uh, and and we're going to continue funneling into things that you may or may not may not value. So it's 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 we need to include a discussion about fiscal policy, what fiscal policy will help attract additional people to come up uh, from the lower 48. Jobs, certainly, high paying jobs uh, will, will increase it. But we need to do what the government can do is reduce, help reduce the cost of living by 
allowing them to keep more money. Uh, middle income families allow them to keep uh, more money uh, in their pockets. There, that hasn't been part of the discussion. It needs to be part of the discussion. Uh, I mean, I would agree with that. And I think, you know, it's interesting to see that, uh, what is it, 14 years, I think, is the low right now. It's It's been, the in-migration reduction has been going on for up to, I think, 14 years is what the article said, um, <clears throat> which is a is a big chunk. And of course, you know, we had the, 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 the crises of the, of the mid teens there, uh, to, to deal with and everything else, um, coming out of the crises of the 07, 08 problems and everything else. Uh, and then you've got COVID and I'm not sure that some of this doesn't play back into COVID as well because people, um, well, the whole workforce kind of changed with COVID, uh, where people were not necessarily looking for that, career path as much as they were looking for to make enough money to get by and to experience things, which you think Alaska would offer more than anybody else. I mean, we're the last great frontier, right? The land of adventure. You want to come up here and find it. But it is, it, I mean, these are the kind of questions we need to be asking. And the biggest part that they said is that uh, in one of the articles that you sent me was that the lag in the economy uh, of the Alaska economy overall compared to the lower 48, even during those times, has been a big contributor to it. The Alaska economy has been behind the lower 48 economy for years. And and we never really have pulled ourselves out of that slump, starting with the recession during, you know, b before the Walker administration, et cetera. We're still dealing with that because we just can't fix our fiscal house. Yeah, exactly right. I mean, we're draining money out of the economy. We're draining money out of the economy. We're draining money in particular out of the pockets of middle income families. Um, and, and we're saying, you know, we're going to create a bunch of new toys, uh, you know, a better uh, uh, child care system, a better university system, a better K through 12 system. We're going to create a bunch of these toys that will attract people up from the lower 48. Well, it hasn't. It's not, it's not showing that it's doing that. And in the meantime, we're, 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 we're using up the advantage we have of reducing up our, of reducing uh, our high cost of living and allowing people to keep more money um, in their pockets. So yeah, yeah, there, there needs to be part of this discussion needs to be, are we pursuing a fiscal policy that attracts people or are we pursuing a fiscal policy that pushes them away? And I think I think the the what what I've seen and what the and what the numbers are showing is we're pursuing a fiscal policy that pushes people away. We're not pursuing a fiscal policy that allows them to keep money in their pockets. We're pursuing a fiscal policy that says, oh, we're going to throw all these you know additional spending out there and maybe we'll maybe we'll attract you up there while we're taking money out of their pockets. We're leaving the high cost of living in place. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. How does that how does that factor in with what you were saying earlier, where we should be paying these taxes on the cars and everything else? I mean, when you know when they're just using it to do these kind of things, where they're trying to incentivize, you know, spend to incentivize. Well, certainly, getting spending under control is 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 one thing we ought to be doing. But it's rate design, Michael. I mean, who do you charge? Who who are you who are you charging when you do when you have a Turo tax? You're charging tourists, right? Who do you charge when you're taking PFD cuts? You're charging residents, uh, uh, middle income uh, residents in particular, uh, when you do PFD cuts. So it's rate it's rate design uh, around around how you raise revenue, and there there are huge implications of that. If you focus your your revenue coming from middle income families, you're 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 undercutting yourself. If you focus it on on a broad base so that everybody pays less because it's a broad base and you focus it in part on tourists and in part on non-residents, then you begin to have a revenue design that lowers the impact on middle income families. And maybe, maybe it's just meant to destroy the middle class. I mean, I, I just, I mean, at some point that might be part of the goal. I mean, really that, I mean, Michael says that in the chat room. Whoops, nope, where is it? There we go. Well, that's the goal to destroy the middle class. And I think in some ways that, I mean, you know, maybe it's not the spoken goal, but maybe that's the unintended goal. We turn Alaska into a public park and the middle class doesn't have to be here. We've got the dependency class and then we've got the upper echelon and everybody else can enjoy it. Meanwhile, everybody else just needs to go away.
Um, I mean, that's, you know, I, I, I may not disagree with that. I think, I think part of the point is, I think people just skip over the middle class. It's 60%. I mean, the, the low income is the bottom 20%. We talk a lot about the top 20%. The middle income brackets are, are 60% uh, of the state. Lower middle, middle middle, and, and, and upper middle. That's 60% of the state. And I think we just skip over them. I mean, we talk about, oh, we need to, we need to have more government spend to, to deal with the low 20%. We need to focus more on you know, making sure the low 20% aren't left behind. The top 20% just doesn't want to pay it. Um, and so they, they focus on finding revenue measures that don't impact them. And the PFD, PFD cuts is a perfect one. Um, oil doesn't want to pay it. Uh, the top 20% doesn't want to pay it. And so what happens is it gets dumped onto the, onto the middle income brackets and, and people just don't talk about that. I mean, it's, one of one of the uh, one of the problems I have with Andrew Gray, who talks a lot about maintaining the PFD, and I appreciate him for that. But one of the problems I have is he talks about maintaining the PFD for the benefit of low income families. Well, that's true. It's important for low income families, but it's also important for the middle sixty percent. And so when we focus on the low twenty percent, what happens is people go, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we should maintain the PFD for them, but but we give them all these other things. Right. Well, there's a difference. There's a difference in definition. When he talks about protecting the PFD for the lower income families, he doesn't mean actually giving them the PFD. He he means taking that PFD internally into the state and dispersing it and utilizing it to take care of them. I think is the intent there. Now that's more Andy Josephson. I, uh, 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 Gray is is more proactive in defending the PFD itself. Andy Josephson, ex is, that's exactly what, what you just described, what you described there. But Gray, but Gray, I, I give Gray credit because he does talk about maintaining the PFD, maintaining that in, in, in the pockets of the of low income families. But, but, you know, then you have the counter of, oh, but we, we take care of them other ways. The, the people who get ignored in all this and the impact that gets ignored is the impact on middle income families. And they're the ones, they're the ones that are leaving the or, or are leaving the state, and they're the ones that are not coming into the state. But they're also the ones that are being harmed by the fiscal policy we have that that takes more from them than would than we would take from them through alternative uh, alternative revenue measures. So it's I, I think we're just missing it. I mean, I think I think we're missing the impact on middle income families. We either run. We either run to, oh no, we can't tax oil companies. We take the Joe Shearhorn or the Jim Jansen, Joe Shearhorn tactic of it. Oh no, we can't tax the oil companies. And, and you know, the Natasha von Imhoff tactic of, oh no, we can't tax the top 20%. Um, and then the, oh, but we got to spend in favor of the, of the low 20%. I think the middle income families just get ignored. And it's not so much, it's not so much do them in. It's just it's just the harm that's being done by not appreciating the impact that's being done to them uh, by these various programs. It uh, I mean, this is, again, frustrating to watch because none of this is going to be solved until we have some kind of governor on the spending until we have some kind of, of ratchet that where we can pull that down and hold it back, because. Uh, Donna said something earlier that I, I, we really didn't get to uh, when we were talking about the PFD, and she's responding to Kevin McCabe saying, Kevin, we tried that in 2019, having the vote on the PFD, separate legislation for the PFD outside of the budget, instead of hiding it in the budget and making it a single vote. Uh, she said Stedman and company were more angry about that than the budget cuts because they didn't want to have to account for that separately. They didn't want to have to show where they stood on that. It's easier to hide it in the crowd, so to speak. And uh, that's part of the whole, the whole problem here is that there is no governor or ratchet down on the spending of the government. It's whatever they want to spend. That's part of the problem. But, but keep in mind that a spending cap alone doesn't solve the PFD. In fact, it probably makes the PFD issue worse. Because we have a spending cap would still allow for some increase. I mean, James Kaufman's, for example, is is based on inflation. That you still have some increase in the spending cap over time. But we're seeing, as we talked about on last week's show, we're seeing a leveling, if not a decline, uh, in oil revenues over time. 
So what's the grease that makes up the middle between those two? It's PFD cuts. So if you put a spending cap on a loan and say that solves the problem, we don't have to worry about it anymore. And you've got a declining, you've got a declining oil revenue base. You've got, you, you've just increased the pressure on PFD cuts. I mean, right. the, the fiscal policy working group had it right. It has to be right. everything at once. You can't do one thing and say, oh, we've solved the problem now. We don't have to worry about, right. it, about it anymore. I, I agree with that. I agree that it can't be. But wouldn't you agree that the spending cap is the cornerstone of any foundation for things that need to be built on this? I mean. No, I, I think they're all the cornerstone. I mean, I uh, the spending. if you say the spending cap is the cornerstone, then people fixate on that, pass that, and say they've done the done the job. I think yeah. it's all the cornerstone, all it's the pieces. Be. That the fiscal policy working group outlined. I agree. It's got to be holistic for sure. All right, Brad. Well, that's it for today. I'm done. I'm done beating on you. So it's all it's all good. Thanks for coming in this morning. I appreciate it. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.